The NK65 Entry Edition was the first such keyboard to come from an enthusiast vendor, and it's been the choice of many looking to get into the hobby. In its early days, it had some issues keeping in stock, but as that normalized, I was able to get my hands on one. As always, I purchased this with my own money, and to the best of my knowledge, Novel Keys had no way to connect my order to the channel. Let me say right off the bat that this is definitely worth getting over the previous meta like the GK64, but if you're paying even a single dollar over MSRP, you will have played yourself. Let's get into it. The NK65 ships in a plain box in which lies the carrying case. This case, while not incredible, seems adequate. It's rigid enough to probably provide a good amount of protection. It also comes with this cable. It seems alright, and if you're into laying your coil right above your board like some kind of crazy person, it's appropriately shaped for that. I'm happy that these two accessories feel pretty solid. It does make you think about the customs that cost 5 times as much shipping in haphazardly assembled boxes. The overall shape of the NK65 is a wedge. It's got pretty thin bezels and has visible internal marks if you got one of the translucent colors. On the right side are three holes for LEDs that activate on different layers. The black aluminum plate gives the border a dark outline, and the silicone slab gives the bottom half a milky look when viewed from the side. Looking closely at these sides, you can see that as the piece moves from the top to the bottom, it flares out just a bit. From a cursory Google search, it seems like this is called draft, and it's more or less necessary on injection molded parts to help it release. This isn't really big enough to be noticeable though. The rear just has the USB Type-C port located between the backspace and the plus key. This is recessed properly and has a tight cutout as one would expect from an injection molded case. On the bottom is the Novel Keys logo as well as two long feet, more on these later. Overall, this is much more clearly see-through than the often frosted polycarbonate cases. This means that you can more easily see the screw threads and various injection molding marks. When you look up close, there are various small texture differences as well as some vertical lines. Getting even closer, you can see some screw holes looking a little banged up with fracture lines. We'll see why this might happen later in the video. If I was buying this for myself, I would probably go for an opaque one because the clear really brings out all of the things you don't want to see in a case. These random little circles, extraneous ridges, fractures, and the like. I think milled polycarbonate looks more purposeful having no marks that are not necessary for assembly. Maybe if there was RGB underglow to accompany the backlighting, you could take advantage of the translucency, but no such feature exists on the NK65. So all in all, nothing special about the design of the board. It's a wedge, and it's seamless, which is a step above the HHKV at the very least, but not really super interesting to look at. Getting into this thing is a little different from what you may be used to. You'll need to undo six screws from the top under the keycaps, and then sort of whack it until the bottom falls out. Still beats having to undo clips though. Taking a look at this first, you have this giant slab of silicone that actually contributes a significant portion of the total weight. This too appears to be molded in some way because it has all sorts of intricate holes, ups and downs. The bottom piece itself is pretty similar to the stuff I've seen on other plastic pre-builds with these posts, but no ribbing. Even so, it doesn't seem to flex as much as I'd expect. On the outside, we see first of the many head scratchers for the NK65. You may be looking at these long rubber feet and thinking about Rama boards, but they're really nothing alike. These strips are raised significantly on the two ends. I checked under them to see if something in the case was pushing them up, but no. These feet are just shaped like this. So my question here is, what is even the point to having long feet if they're going to be practically four standard feet anyway? I can't comment on the efficacy of four corner feet versus two long feet, but this to me just seems like it's trying to pose as something it's not. Making our way to the top, we can see the plate mounted at a crazy 12 points, eight on the long edges and four on the short ones. These screws, much like the plate screws, are not the machine screws we've come to expect in customs, but rather pointy ones with sharp threads. These are similar to screws in other pre-builds which can be forced into holes at odd angles with relative ease. There are some threads that look damaged already. I'm not sure if I was the one who cracked these or if it came like this from the factory, but this doesn't seem that great for the board's longevity. I would have much preferred to see threaded inserts here with nicer screws. To be fair, the way the NK65 is constructed, you don't need to undo the plate screws really ever, but my point stands for the bottom screws. The plate and the PCB are connected to each other by two screws. These are typically used to provide enough rigidity to install switches into hot swap sockets without having to take the board apart. 
The installation video linked on the site shows bracing from underneath anyway, and having just two won't work well for the top and bottom rows. So this plays no role in hot swap capability other than for basic alignment. Doesn't mean it's useless though. I found that the plated PCB hole connects to the USB shield, which means this aluminum plate is grounded, likely preventing it from getting damaged by shocks. If this is the same solution used in the aluminum edition, this should also effectively ground the case as well. A detail much appreciated from me, and probably necessary for hitting a larger market who won't be so happy to deal with BS issues that's been resolved in gaming keyboards for years. The PCB has per-key RGB as well as correct facing switches. This means your backlit keycaps likely won't work well, but you also won't be running into the cherry profile keycap collision issue. It's programmed with VIA, which is one of the most user-friendly interfaces in the community. The plate seems to be anodized aluminum with a fixed layout and plate mount steps. The PCB doesn't support PCB mount steps, so what you have is what you'll get. The steps come looped from the factory and aren't literal garbage like cheaper boards, but they're also not that great. It doesn't seem like they improved super well, so I'd replace them for whatever the meta is for plate mount steps nowadays. Now, let's tackle the mounting problem on this keyboard. The stated mechanism is a modified top mount. Let's go through all of the connections to the keyboard assembly. There are the aforementioned 12 screws that connect the plate to the top, and there are the two screws that connect the PCB to the plate. This much is pretty standard, but there are six additional screws that connect the top plate to the bottom case. Let's call these the top, assembly, and bottom screws, respectively. In a typical top mount keyboard, you'd have just the top screws and none of the others. The keyboard assembly is untouched by any other screws that could create hotspots. However, the NK65's addition to the assembly and bottom screws means that this keyboard is basically top mount and tray mount at the same time. I don't have a concrete way to test this, but my intuition tells me that whichever is the harder of the mounts will just cancel out all of the rest. So essentially, the NK65 is a tray mount keyboard with extra steps. To validate this a bit, I tried first affixing the assembly to the bottom, then putting the top on. The height of the assembly seems unchanged, so we can be fairly certain that the bottom of the PCB is making direct contact with the bottom posts. To confirm the inverse, I tried putting the board together without the bottom screws and it seems to work just fine, so I think when fully assembled, you have 12 plate attachment points and 6 tray attachment points. So this is essentially the same thing as cutting a tray mount case in half and adding plate mounting points in addition to the tray points. Naturally, the top mount points aren't going to do anything. So this to me is just a pointless addition that was no doubt for the express purpose of escaping the dreaded tray label. But don't get it twisted, this is a tray mount keyboard. If I designed the keyboard with modified gasket mount, but the modifications were to get rid of the gaskets and instead screw the plate into the top, I could still call it whatever I want, but it won't really be close to gasket mount, would it? I saw Mike from Novel Keys saying this is not like a tray because the bottom screws are actually affixed to the plate rather than the PCB. I don't think that's a meaningful distinction because the plate and the PCB are essentially one assembly. To go a step further, you could argue this is even harder than a regular tray mount keyboard because in addition to the 6 tray screws, there are a grand total of 10 case protrusions that contact the bottom of the PCB. If this wasn't enough, there are 6 silicone protrusions that do the same. This discussion about the mounting mechanism does reach a point of irrelevance because at the time of writing, only aluminum plates are available. In my opinion, the differences in mounting without gasket materials only really becomes evident once you escape metal plates. To test this, I tried the keyboard at its most flexible position, with only the four side screws and without the bottom. The maximized distance between the mounting points should give us what the absolute extreme bounce feels like, and it's really not that much. When I tried the exact same thing in my G60 first impression stream, I found that the result was one of the most bouncy feeling plated 60% boards I've ever felt. Not even close here. It seems that the hardness of the aluminum plate overpowers any difference in mounting. So whether it is or isn't a tray mount doesn't really matter from a typing feel perspective because it just feels like an aluminum plate keyboard. I've heard rumors about different plate materials coming soon for the NK65, so that's when things like the true top mount mod from keyboard is going to start making a real difference. I think this keyboard is about the quality you'd expect from the $95 price tag. There are certain qualities that show some enthusiast attention, but if you start to detach it from the community origin, you can see it for what it really is, a pre-built. The NK65 without the slab of rubber sounds like any other plastic pre-built keyboard, maybe even a little hollower than usual. 
With it, it maybe sounds a little more like a milled plastic keyboard, but don't expect aluminum sounds out of this. Have a listen, while keeping in mind that sound tests are never representative of real life. I think the NK65 is a great addition to the entry-level options that's been missing in the community for so many years. People can try enthusiast features like correct switch orientations and full programmability at the same price point as regular pre-builds like the AND Pro or the GK64. I think it's a good value and you should definitely pick it up over those pre-builds, but it doesn't mean I don't take issue with some aspects of its marketing and features implementation. I'm not a fan of the fragile threads and I don't like the poser rubber feet. I don't like how you're forced into plate mount stabs when they could probably just send uninstalled PCB mount ones instead. The quote unquote modified top mount is at best a misunderstanding and at worst false advertising. I would like to see this point removed altogether from the product page. All that aside, is this a good keyboard? Maybe as your first, sure. It being plastic means many avenues of customization and I can see it filling the same role as my AND Pro while being an overall better experience. I also think this won't really fill any niche beyond other entry-level keyboards. You're going to get this and either do or don't get into the hobby. And if you do, you're going to leave this behind because there are still many improvements to be made. Like I said before, I don't think they can charge much more than the current $95 because you start to get into higher-end pre-builds like Leopold's which come with switches and nice keycaps. And soon after that, you'll have to contend with the GMMK Pro. Which by the way, I have coming pretty soon. Get subscribed for that. So the most important takeaway for you should be that under no circumstances should you buy one of the double price NK65s on eBay. Or really any of the others like the Kara, Portico, or Iki68 when they ship, because at the end of the day, the injection molded cases will be unable to escape the cheap, mass-produced feel present in every pre-built. 